really more personal. We have okay. plenty of people talking. Bye, to take one more. Yeah. Um, can you just start telling us about the first time you met Dr. King and what that was like and how you felt? You know, the first time I saw Dr. King, I, I honestly don't remember whether I actually met him. He came to a high school gathering of kids from all over the country, and we were all discussing world affairs. It was all about nonviolence. And they speak every year. They had a speaker, and that year was Dr. King. So I just stood there and wept for the entire speech because this man was doing what I had read about, you know, and studied about. And then all of a sudden, there's this person talking about the bus boycott and people, you know, walking instead of riding. And so it was everything I'd read about was actually taking place. And I'm so overwhelmed still with that moment. I honestly don't remember when I met him there. I was a 16-year-old kid along with all the rest of them. Um, and I don't remember officially when I, when I met him. I know it was at one of the conferences. Um, we finally had a face-to-face. -face. It was like you cut out the time to do that. And we started doing a lot of joking. So it's a healthy way to begin. You, what kind of jokes? So you, you, were you intimidated and then you met him as a jokester? Was it, did he disarm you in that kind of way? Um, no, the very first talk, I think we were both sort of a little bit intimidated, maybe. Um, later on, I mean, his jokes, and Andy knows it too, they all know it. He, they would tell dirty jokes by the hour, by the hour. I went to pick up, I got, was allowed to go in, in the car full of lieutenants. There was Jesse and Bevel and Andy, and we went to pick up Dr. King. I think it was to bring him into Grenada. And they said, yeah, I could come along, I thought, because a huge demonstration planned for the next day. So I went, and I thought, oh, man, I'm really going to get the inside story on how they organized one of these things. They picked him up at the airport, and they told end jokes from the airport to their favorite restaurant where he ate everything you would think he would order, his fried chicken, okra, potatoes, apple pie at the end, got back in the car and continued until we got back to the conference. And I asked Andy later, I said, Andy, I thought I was going to hear how you guys order, you know, organize a march. And he said, you did. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Grenada. And, and that was that the first, you know, in, the, in your experiences there and uh, the resistance to segregation, you know, when seg legally segregation was, was uh, so, you know, the, the resistance to legal segregation and mm -hmm. how difficult it was going to be. My first experience... Um, in the South was 1961, and I went there and gave concerts, and the contract actually said, and I, of course, never looked at it, whites only. I was mortified. I went back the next year, 62, with that changed. Of course, no blacks came. They didn't me know who I was. So I went back the third year and sang in black campuses. And um, I was, in fact, singing it. I was furious because I wanted to be in town in the middle of all the arrests that so was in Birmingham. Um, and I sang, which school is Miles? It was Miles. And I gave a concert there. So I had already launched that feeling you get in the South <laughs> when you're going to say something real. And um, so what brought you and, and King to Grenada? To Dr. King called to find out if I would go to Grenada because he couldn't get there on, on the right away. And so, and he thought if the cameras were rolling, then maybe the whites would stop throwing rocks at the kids, which is what happened. The first day I was alone with my people and, you know, the, the marchers and the people, but not King. Um, and, and so it did probably hold things off for a day, and then he came in. Um, the next day, and we were <laughs> we were marching, and it, I think we have it in our films of, to that giant cop on the corner. And I just stood there and said, "We'd like to, we'd like these children to go to school." You know, and he says, "You can't go no further." And so I talked a little more about, you know, they wanted their education. You can't go no further. And somewhere on that. March, I was walking with King, and I saw all of us, and these kids, they ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, and, and across the street with these miserable-looking little clutch of white kids. And I went like this to King, and I said, 
you sure you want to go through with this? That's what they're going to be in class with. And he says, no, well, the camera's are rolling, Joan. <laughs> Coming to Grenada after um, Chicago and the sort of de perceived defeat of Chicago, did you, is, you t people talk about how depressed he was some nights and, and, and how, you know, what would it take to get him? Did you see that and how did that make you feel when you saw him? You know, I honestly don't remember much of that, but maybe because I was still in the glow, you know. Um, I saw more of the people extra trying to extract power from him as in, you know, the Black Power, the Black Panther movement. And, um, I mean, young people saying, well, you've been oppressed for 200 years. And I say, how old are you? You know, I got, I think, combative with that because it takes off on its own freight train. And there are really young people who hadn't kind of earned their position, you know, I felt to be, you know, gobbling that up. Um, and in some of those situations, I, I was sort of made fun of or, you know, you don't get a girlfriend and, and that kind of stuff. But I don't remember specifically being talked about as depressed. And how did it feel being the young white girl in this <laughs> world of these people and how are you treated? I was a young brown girl, probably, right. in the world of his people. Well, the biggest compliment I ever had in the South was some kid, and we were at the church in probably Grenada, and I was singing, uh, you know, a spiritual, um, break bread together or swing low, and some little black kid looked up at my friend and said, is she, I mean, does she got, I mean, is she, <laughs> and he said, is she black, Negro, is she Negro? And maybe she is a little bit somewhere. <laughs> I thought at the um, did did I thought there, was there a time then when when King was depressed and, and Andy sent you in to sing to him to. Mm -hmm. um, it was Grenada where uh, um, Dr. King was really really tired after coming in, and um, they had put him to, to bed in this you know the master bedroom, which is a small humble little lovely place. And uh, nobody wanted to wake him up, and he was due to speak, you know, to a church down the street. And, the, you know, half an hour late, then an hour late, and then he even got beyond CPT. You know, it was, so nobody says, says, Joan, you go in and wake him up. And so I went into the room, and I, I just remember as I was looking at a chocolate drop on this pillow, everything in the room was white, white doilies, white sheets, and there was Black King. And um, so I sang... Um, swing low, and he didn't wake up, he just rolled over and he said, hmm, I believe I hear the sound of an angel, let's have another one, Joan. <laughs> so. And how did you feel about walking down the streets with King and, and the kids? I was elated walking down the street with King and the kids, because was, I remember one of the, one of the, um, when I heard a preacher, it wasn't, Birmingham was a place like that, a young preacher singing at midnight. His, his sermon was called Singing at Midnight, and it ended up saying, everybody's going to join us because this is where they're going to want to be. You know, this is anybody with any um, kind of ideals or desire to do something was going to come to be with us um, because it was joyful and it was strong and it was full of music and and there was danger, and so what? No. We'll jump to the um, to the Penn Center. Remember the strategy sessions in South Carolina? <laughs> I um, hated them. <laughs> <laughs> Penn Center. Um, I don't remember where the different conferences right, were. Right. We'll talk about Penn Center and then Early House later. But on Penn okay. Center, you just um, well Taylor Branch talks about it being um, that the SCLC was very divided then in South Carolina. There's mm -hmm. just these sort of fights. Were you privy to that? Did you have a feeling that, this, that, that, that these internal divisions are where to go next and what to do? Um, um, paying attention to the divisions and the splits and the, at the conferences. And there, there were internal power, you know, personal difficulties and then there was the difficulty of how are we going to maintain what is our what is our mission statement is it still nonviolence or is it moving into something else 
So I think probably with the younger people, they were thinking about moving on, you know, meaning moving backwards. But um, and then the other stuff, there are personal things, and you know about them, so I won't bother going into them. But yeah, that, I mean, any conference of, of that type and so high powered, and you know, it just seems as though King was almost. Dr. Martin Luther King by default. I mean, I don't think he really necessarily wanted that position, but he got it. And he was, for all of us, the right person. And he took it seriously. He knew he was going to be killed. Yeah. You describe him as like the most laid back person you ever <laughs> met. But other people talk, but he also would play pool and eat and joke around with people. Can you talk about like as a person, his personality a little bit? Dr. King's personality, when he's not on stage. First of all, when he was speaking, he didn't really dare do much humor because he was. there were so many eyes on him and so many critics and people ready to, I mean, it would have been, ha, ha, you know, he's just joking around, he's not serious. So he really didn't see much of that in his speeches and his public presence. Um, but for me, off stage, it was I could either have a genuine talk about nonviolence and about or about personal things, or it was in the situation like the car where everybody's joking, which is really fun. And what other personal things would he talk about besides when you weren't talking about the movement? What, like? What? Well, Dr. King knew how moved I was when he spoke. And he said at one point, I always say nonviolence once or twice extra when I know Joan Baez is in the audience and makes her cry. <laughs> and it did. I mean, that just fell apart when he started his, his what he did. <laughs> I love hearing all the different people impersonate doing their, their King voice. <laughs> it's just really fantastic. Um, in terms of, uh, King is a man, and how he dealt with women. Do you th was he like? There's a lot of sexism in that world. Does he, did he feel more or less a feminist or enlightened than that world? I mean, how did you feel? It seems like a boys' club, and you're the woman in this boys' club. For Dr. King to have been a feminist is pretty much a stretch, I would think. You know, it hadn't reached that point in time in history. Um, on the other hand, I mean, those churches are run by moms. And uh, you don't find any young man ever, really, in sports, well, to what do you owe your whatever? And they'll say, my mama. You know, so the mamas really <laughs> ran the whole thing. They just didn't, you know, they were pretty much, well, I shouldn't say that. If they got ticked off in a church, they would let themselves be known, be heard. They were wonderful. <laughs> I'll jump a little into... Um into Vietnam and and um, the sort of the schism or the where to go with SCLC towards you know um, you know the fight to, to either Operation Breadbasket against the war uh, anti poverty all these sort of divisions and of course you were more on the anti war um, camp can you talk about that as that division came up and those discussions and how you felt about it and what you how you felt the movement was changing then how was responding to this. You know, there's the riots, there's the war, and there's a uh, civil rights movement all happening at the same time in the, you know, yeah. 65, 66. And then there I was in jail, you know, about the war. And when Dr. King came to visit me, I, don't, I think he was barely, it was 67, barely getting his grounding as far as where he was going to be on the war. I mean, he knew where his heart was. But he also knew the criticism and the splits that would happen the moment he said anything against the war in Vietnam. And of course, he did, and that was the end of his relationship with the White House. Um, you know, in a way, it's good riddance, but it also it was devastated. Uh, his, his work and his, he needed, the things he needed. Um, he, you know, I mean, I think that Riverside Church, he, he knew. That's when he really knew is what I think. And how did you feel when you read and you heard that speech or read about it? <laughs> I still listen to it and I'm a mess. I just weep through the whole thing. 
I wasn't there, but... Um... <laughs> did you have a feeling about, like, about, about time? I mean, did you feel like it was a year too late? Did you feel that he'd finally come around? No, I didn't feel... I mean, I'd seen him work. I wasn't kind of plugging to try and drink, bring that out of him at all. I feel as though, you know, he had given so much and done so much. And um, it was just, I was surprised and absolutely delighted and sort of shocked, you know. Did you think that his, um, his uh, silence on the war, um, his, you know, that the, the, we talked about the, the lead up to the Riverside speech. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that it was building up within him, that it was affecting him, that he had to sort of bite his tongue because of the politics at the time, because of Johnson and, and the SCLC finances? Did you feel that that was eating away at him as a moral man, that he knew that he, you know, or the, you know the, this struggle to come out yeah, of Yeah, I'm not sure how engaged I was in his struggle to decide what move to take next, whether it included Vietnam or um, he, when he did. In fact, one of the first times he did was when he came to visit my mom and me in prison, in jail. And uh, I remember somebody said something about David Harris, who's my ex, who was a big shot in the resistance movement. And I know Dr. King didn't know the name. Um, and somebody kind of got it to him in time. But he was new to the whole business. So that was 67. Um, and... Uh, he made a statement. I don't know if you have that speech or not. Yeah, I think he said something about, he began anyway talking about that immoral war. So. Speaking of the war, like in Chicago, they talked about the returning veterans already, like the, mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, especially these black veterans and the, and the disproportionate number of black and brown people being killed. Um, was, how did you, like in terms of the, combining the anti-war movement with this sort of, it seems like it should have been a natural fit. Was there, were there discussions about that, that this is, this is a poor, this poverty and the war really, there's a link between them? Poverty and the war and Dr. King knew the links between them. And I think he did talk about our young black soldiers coming home and they can't, you know, they, they have no status. Um, and over there they did, or they got killed, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I heard him dealing with that particular business. Did you think that the Riverside Church speech that it was was there a different did it was there a pivot in his sort of politics after that or? No, I don't think. Although I don't know what speeches came before that. Um, I think that at that point whether he knew it or not during that speech maybe because he would take off as you know in flight on those speeches and either it came to him the way things did or he knew ahead of time it almost sounds as though during his own sermon he began to understand you know what what he had to do and what he would probably pay for it and then the pivot, like the focus of this documentary, there's a pivot from that to this internationalizing, you know, poverty, wars against poverty and peace as a, as a global issue. Did mm -hmm. you feel that sense that he was starting to understand that it was bigger than Birmingham or Selma? Oh, no. he always knew that. He always knew it was bigger than Birmingham or Selma. Um, and I don't know where I was at those specific moments with the you know, with the workers in Chicago and all that. Um, I wasn't that deeply involved at that point. So, but see. I mean, it's a feeling. Did you feel looking back now, looking at how he's, like, we keep thinking of if he had lived, where would he have gone? And yeah. the movement went, and he was pushing towards the Poor People's Campaign, for example. Does that... Yeah. What would he have done, you mean? Yeah. If he... Yeah. When he had to reorganize himself after Chicago. I don't know. The end of Gandhi's career when everything started falling apart between uh, India and Pakistan he said he, he would take his shoes off and walk and start over again everywhere just go on what he always did <laughs> so maybe that would be what Dr. King would do It'd be hard to imagine him deciding you know he wanted to quit or retire or uh, 
going to teaching. <laughs> he was, he did what he did. Right. At that low point, uh, you know, after the March on Washington, about 70% of Americans had a favorable opinion of him. By the, uh, by the time of uh, the Poor People's Campaign, 66% of Americans had a negative opinion of him. Mm -hmm. um, did, you, did he talk about that? Did you feel that weight mm -hmm. on him? Didn't talk about it. And I'm thinking by as we're talking now that I wasn't present in my mind for a lot of those things, that I wasn't analyzing the Civil Rights March or Dr. King and, and what's he going to do next. Right. It's just there was time, I guess, back then where they said, um, where I guess you told somebody, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to be a, like a little country preacher yeah, again. I remember that, yeah. Was that to you or is that? Um, when Dr. King started saying openly, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to be a country preacher. I might have heard him say that when he was drunk one time or I heard it enough from other people that I thought I heard it from him. And when he was drunk and saying that, was there a sense of, did you feel for him or was it more just always a friendly drunk or did your heart, get, like, how did you feel? I always felt for Dr. King. I mean, I couldn't imagine the pressure that was on him. Nobody could. None of us could imagine that. Um, so I, I just would probably support him, supported him with just about anything. There's a, there's a story you, where he says, uh, he, he, you know, we, he, he finished in the next morning saying, now you know that I'm, now you know I'm not a, not a saint. Do you remember that? I do remember. And that was the first kind of formal meeting that we had, just the two of us. Because um, he'd been drunk and carrying on and everybody knew it and Coretta was hiding somewhere, I don't know where. And um, I was surprised at that point. And I think, you know, Andy was supportive. Then, um, and I, what did I say? He said he wasn't a saint, and I said I'm not a virgin or something like that. Whatever it was, it was, it was par to what, to what he was saying, and we had a little chuckle. And that kind of is when um, our relationship began, beyond me listening to him or him listening to me. Um, so we go back a little bit just so we have it as one piece. When you first... So you 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 meet him and he's do you meet him and he's already drunk or are you you're no, watching no. get no at some point on you know at some point in our SCLC career I and I don't think um, I don't know where this was in time you know but it was that I somehow or other had left behind the image of the Virgin Mary. And he had clearly just given up his image of being a saint. And so with that, we, we had our first time, just, hi, let's talk. And that was what came out. Well, now that you know I'm not a saint, and I said, now that you know I'm not a virgin, I'm not sure how I made that clear. But, um, <laughs> and then we were off and running. You're with Andy and the, everybody, you're having a talk, and then he is, you're just watching him dr getting drunker and drunker? He was something? in another room. King wasn't even, uh, he was in another room, we heard him, you know. And what did it sound like in the other room? It sounded like a drunk guy. <laughs> could you, you know, this is hard, but could you tell us about the moment you heard about his assassination and where you were and, and, and that week? I don't know where I was, I was in a hotel room somewhere and I completely went into denial. They said, are you going to go to the funeral? I said, oh no, huh? I don't go to funerals. I didn't feel anything until 10 or 15 years later. And I was here in this house watching, a, you know, a documentary came on about Dr. King. I thought, well, I'll watch this. I just dissolved. My son remembers walking through the room and wondering what had happened to his mother. I was just uh, devastated. And all the feelings that I might have had back then, I was having 10 years later. It was just too overwhelming. So, you know, in the history books, we celebrate these, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott, the uh, Selma march. Why do you think it's important to think about, to, to discuss and study his later struggles, his later fights? I think discussing and admitting to King's later fights and, or anything, whether it was depression or his foibles, 
I think it makes a difference in whether you're looking at somebody who's unattainable. What he does is like in another world. Is uh, I think when they become human, I think it's very important for us to see that that you can go on doing the good works and have slipped and fallen, you know, or gotten drunk or womanized or whatever he was into doing. Again, since we have no idea really what that feels like, we don't have any room to criticize it. Diane Nash talks about uh, the perils of charismatic leaders and following a charismatic leader as opposed to a movement, following the movement. How do you feel about that? I think that discussing a movement with or without a leader is a topic for discussion that has I haven't found a solution to. Um, I think ideally a movement would be leaderless. I think practically I have not seen it um, working, you know. Um, some places, like the Serbian uprising, they're all kids, average age 22, and they all read sharp on nonviolence, and they followed that, and they really didn't, I mean, they were in cells. It's what Occupy wanted to do, um, to, to be separate cells all over the country. Well, Serbia is small, the kid knew exactly what they wanted, um, and they managed to do it without one, you know, one specific leader. There are people who were the ones you'd seek to go talk to, but basically you could have talked to anybody. Um, I don't know any other. Not that I'm much of a historian, but... Um, How do you think that, that your friendship with Dr. King changed the course of your life? Dr. King is one of the most important people who moved me beyond um, being a student of nonviolence or being a practitioner, you know, beyond just whatever stubbornness I was showing at home. I refused to stand up and salute this flag and all that. Um, by the way, King and I always had this fight over the state of America because the war was going on and I thought this place was pretty decadent and he would give his speech about wanting their share of the American pie. And I would say, uh, pie is really not very tasty right now. And we'd always have this fight about it because that was part of his speech. You know? I can't remember what the question was. Oh, I was just thinking, just thinking how he changed his life, changed the course of your life. Changed my life. Well, I three or four people made an impact on my life the way Dr. King did um, to really care about him. You know, there are people I've admired, haven't gotten that close to, and I was able to get close to him. And again, it was seeing nonviolence in action that, you know, won my heart and made me want to go work with him and be with him. And how about to this day? How do you, how do you, how do you think, why do we need that less, those lessons today with what's going on in the <laughs> world today? What's going on in the world today is beyond anything anybody could have imagined. It's uh, so corrupt, and of course we need those voices. Um, it's hard to hear them when, they, when the right wing owns the press, you know. Uh, so we need, of course we need. I, I would say that right now um, we need to understand the power of nonviolence because to try and anything other than that right now is self-defeating and treacherous. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you talk about Andy Young and, and Martin's relationship, um, how it was seeing them together. He's... I thought Dr. King and Andy were very close. Um, Andy was, uh, they joked about him because he was the only one who was really brave. They would prop him up in the front of the <laughs> march, you know. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard it from more than one source, and I heard it back then, that they had him in the front of the march somewhere, and a bunch of kids came out and knocked him on the head, and he passed out, and they were dragging him along, <laughs> keeping him in the front. And the kids went around the block and hit him again, and he woke up. That makes sense to me. <laughs> in terms of uh, entertainers, we've we interviewed you, know, you and Harry Belafonte, um, what was the role and how did King come to enlist and use entertainment 
And for himself, I know he's a big Mahalia Jackson fan. Was he ever, does he, was he ever a super fan of anybody? Was there, was there a sense that he's a regular guy who was a super fan of someone? I never, I never knew whether King had, you know, what, what in the entertainment world really interested him. I'm not sure he had much time for it. But he knew that strategically it was one of the, it was a really smart use of... Well, to try and have a movement without the music would have been ridiculous. Plus, it's there. I mean, it's just there. Um, I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. It's just it's like saying good morning. You know, a picture of two kids, which I saw, they had to be 10 or 12, and marching with a Miss Washington, I guess, with a sign saying freedom or the like. And a cop running at them. And they got down on their knees and went on singing. And the cop didn't know what to do with himself. You know, it was too embarrassing to, not always, but in this case, too embarrassing to, you know, hit them, knock them out, whatever his plan was. If they had just flipped them the bird, it would have been enough to do whatever he really had in his heart to do. <laughs> Are there any are there other stories about King, like personal stories, non you know political, or just things that come up, anecdotes you remember that you know that would really sort of again this idea of humanizing King mm -hmm. and what he's been through. I saw him one night at the, one of the conferences, SCLC conference, and somebody wanted to know about where the finances stood, and either he didn't know or he didn't want to talk about it, so he started preaching about everything else, everything else, until everybody was all riled up and singing and clapping and he got away with it, got away with it because he was so charismatic and lovable, you know. So it was tricky. Sorry? He was tricky. He was tricky. He had, I mean, not many people have, have the combination of things he had. He had the vision, he had if he didn't have the organizational stuff himself, he was surrounded by people who did. Um, and he had the knack for taking an idea that he could have done alone, because that he had to be able to do it alone, but with the organizing and with his kind of special gift, he didn't have to do it alone. There'd be 150,000 people there with him. It's like Gandhi's march to the sea. He went down to pick up a grain of salt to defy the British by the time he got there. He had half a million people with him. And that's a very specific gift. And that would be something where it would be highly questionable whether you'd want this person to be a leader or not. Because without him, um, it's those ideas and that courage and charisma. I just want to go back a little bit to Vietnam and Chicago. And the, the, can you give us a sense for people today in 2018 about the, the level of violence um, on the streets between the rioting, the, um, the violence of the war, uh, the sense of, in this violent, tumultuous time, how revolutionary and nonviolence and how difficult maybe it was to be that, that commitment to nonviolence. Um, probably more difficult to organize nonviolence than to organize violence. I think we figured that out after a millennium. Um, yeah, I was wondering about, yeah, personally, we, we can't even understand. We have, you know, we live in interesting times right, right oh, now, That's of a course. lovely way to say it. <laughs> but, but, the, um, but the violence, the assassinations, um, let's see, before even of the J JFK assassinations, the rioting in Watts and Detroit, um, the, the anti-war movement in Kent State, like the, there's a world of violence, and then here's this message of nonviolence. Can you just personally... How did you feel when you wake up in the morning? Uh, people talk about, Clarence Jones talked about how you felt like people don't understand how close the country was to <laughs> breaking apart. Or did you feel that? Uh, I always felt that the world was close to falling apart. And that's, of course, obviously how I feel now. Um, but I had the understanding from when I was about 12 that adding to the violence was not going to do anything. It was not going to help anybody, any side. Um, so I just took a path then. And um, I took it and I never really left it. It's the only thing that made any sense to me. So I knew that for the most part, people wouldn't know what I was talking about. They would think I was nuts. They would belittle it. They would give you the what would you do if scenarios in which you can't get out alive. 
Um, and you have to just know all that stuff and keep walking. <laughs> Certainly people of your generation, of younger than King, were, many of them were pulled in more radical or you know, violent directions. Um, did you ever question it yourself? I mean, you said from 12 you had that moment, but did you ever have yeah. any kind of... Whether I had any... Second thoughts. Second thoughts about nonviolence, organized or otherwise. I don't think so. I mean, I, when Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda, you know, spoke out against um, some nonviolent stand that I had taken, um, I, it never, I mean, I just thought that they didn't get it. <laughs> they probably didn't. Um, so, I, no, I sort of, maybe I was dumb, but I just blithely went on my way. And um, that was my belief system. And it, it, it never, I mean, it wasn't as though something came along to challenge it that looked like a really whole better way to do things. Um, so. <laughs> and in retrospect, do you, how do you feel that nonviolence is fair? Do you think it still has... Um, I don't think nonviolence has even had a chance to come into its own, except a couple of times. And it may not, because it's difficult. You know, I guess Gandhi said that the human psyche is both violent and nonviolent. And the question is, which one are you going to organize? So, after all these years of violence, and people are just addicted to it. Just, they can't make themselves think another way. So, and in, in the atmosphere we're in now, so the year of the bully, um, it's even harder to try and present, uh, to try and present something other than either being a liberal, which isn't enough, being a progressive, which is, hasn't really pulled itself together in a way that it can make itself understood. Um, I think Right now, I have this little saying, it's little victories and big defeats, because we're living in a big defeat. I mean, we're living, but the, our background of scenario is global warming. So that's not exactly a leg up, <laughs> you know, for kids. So that's there, and you have to do everything in spite of that. And then the bully comes along, and everything gets worse every single day. Things get worse um, for the majority of the people in this country. Most of them don't even understand that yet. So it's against that scenario that we need to be very inventive, <laughs> very imaginative to find our way through it, and very um, dedicated. Do you have hope right now, or on, your, on the hope scale, how do you, how do you? Well, on the hope scale, I've never been very hopeful. On the other hand, I'm not hopeful about the state of the world. I am hopeful about people's resilience and what we can do if we really want to do it. Um, and I think courage, courage is the most important um, of all the virtues, to be courageous. And courage is contagious. Um, I mean, violence is contagious, but guess what? You know, so is courage. And so if you've experienced nonviolence in its, you know, in its various forms, it can also be contagious if you have a moment to see what it's actually doing and see that it's possible and uh, see that it's not soft, it's not weak, it's very strong. You can refer to it as fighting, um, battling, but just different tools. They're different tools. <laughs>